So a scientific question here, just to start us off, a, a very scientific poll I want to conduct. Is this bottle mostly full or mostly empty? I'm just curious. Those of you who say mostly full, who said yes? <laughs> mostly full. Anybody mostly full? Mostly empty. I figured that that's where it would be because nobody ever participates, and I figured that's the way it would be uh, this morning. But for years, this question, type of question has been used to decide if you are an eternal optimist or if you are more pessimistic. Uh, do you have a rosy outlook on life that everything is great and you're always finding the silver lining no matter what is happening? Or do you tend to be more of uh, gloom and doom and find the negative in everything? And I'm not going to ask where you are at today on that. Um, some of us in this room are optimistic. We're like the boy with a bad report card and his dad asked him, what do you have to say for all this? And he said, well, dad, one thing for sure, you know, I haven't been cheating. Um, that's <laughs> hold on to that, guys. Report cards are coming out soon right? There's always a reason for optimism. And then some are just like gloom, despair, and agony on me. You know, everything that can go wrong is going to go wrong. That's the way some of us just lean. But I asked the question this past week uh, to our staff, uh, to some of our leadership team, and the question was simply this. Do you find yourself to be optimistic or pessimistic today about the future of the church in America and in the West? Do you find yourself in an optimistic about the future of the church, or do you find yourself to be very pessimistic? And when I talk about the church, I'm not just talking about the church here in Centerburg. I'm talking about the church in our nation today. Are we optimistic or are we pessimistic? And there's reasons for both, and I got both answers, to be honest with you. People told me they were optimistic. Some said I'm optimistic, but I'm still pessimistic. Some were pessimistically optimistic, whatever that means. But they gave me reasons for both. For those who were optimistic, uh, they said, you know, the message of Jesus is still the power that we have, and it still frees people from sin, and it still changes and transforms lives. And so there's reason for optimism, but when it comes to the future of the church, most people found themselves to be pessimistic, and the reason why, they said, look at our culture today and the landscape that we have. So let me give you some identifying marks of our culture today and reason why people found themselves to be pessimistic about the future of the church. One, we are seeing a rise in pluralism in our culture today. And what that means is that worship of many gods is now acceptable. Not just acceptable, it is actually preferred. Why limit yourself to one when you can worship many? That's what we're seeing today. And we're also seeing right now um, the church no longer enjoying favored status. You know, I am old enough to remember that nothing happened in the community, nothing happened in the school without the church knowing what was going on. And you did not compete against church with school things. Anybody else remember that? I, I just, I remember that. And now we're no longer there. The church no longer enjoys a favored status. We also have a culture that is extremely busy. <laughs> we have a culture that is extremely busy, and it seems like we're not making time for the things of God and for the things of church. There is competition from other places now everywhere. And then also there's just a lack of general knowledge about who God is, about who Jesus is, and about what he desires for our lives. And don't think that we're exempt from that just because we're in Centerburg and in a rural community. It was about 10 years ago. I had a conversation with a young man who told me, I don't even know the story of Jesus and where to even begin. Do those cultural landmarks sound, sound correct? Is this what we're seeing in our culture today? Yeah, this is what we're seeing in our culture today. And it's because of that that people find themselves to be pessimistic about the future of the church. Here's what I'm learning, too. The older I get, you know, the older I get, still 25, but the older I get, <laughs> it's a good thing we dealt with forgiveness last week. <laughs> I'm taking names, by the way. The older I get, the easier it is to become pessimistic about the future of things. Anybody else find that to be true? And that's because we remember the way things used to be, and we're not seeing them going back there. And so it becomes very easy to become pessimistic. And I think that's why a lot of people find themselves to be pessimistic about the future of the church today. But let me tell you something. This is where I stand on that question. I am more optimistic today about the future of the church than I have ever been. And it's not just because I am an eternal optimistic person. That's not what it is. 
I find myself to be more optimistic about the future of the church today than I have ever been. And here's the reason why. I can give you a lot of reasons, but just let me give you one. Here's one reason why I am optimistic about the future of the church. It's the book of Acts. It's the book of Acts. That's why I am optimistic about the future of the church. Uh, You know, when you read through the pages of the book of Acts, you read about a church in Acts chapter 2 that started with about 100 people. The very first day of the church, we see over 3,000 people responding and becoming followers of Jesus. The church experiences such explosive growth, and by the end of the book of Acts, 28 chapters, the church has reached the very capital of the world, Rome, and the gospel message about Jesus has spread from Jerusalem, the small town, all the way to the ends of the earth in just 28 short chapters. This is why I'm optimistic about the future of the church today, because the book of Acts is not just an event that happened in a place in time. The book of Acts is a story, and it's a picture of what God wants to do in every place and in every time and in every future. I do not believe that the God of the book of Acts no longer exists. I believe we have the same God today. Do you believe that? The same God that we read of in the pages of the book of Acts is still alive and well and still wants to do the same thing in our time and in our community, in our place here and now. That's why I'm optimistic about the future of the church. Luke starts off Acts chapter 1, if you've got your Bibles, open up there, and he reminds us that he had written another book, the Gospel of Luke, to his friend Theophilus. And he says that in my former book, I wrote about all the things that Jesus began to do and to teach while he was here. So the Gospel of Luke is all about Jesus and what Jesus did, namely his death on the cross that has forgiven us of our sins, his resurrection that gives us a hope for the future. And then he writes in the book of Acts the work that Jesus continued to do through the power of the Holy Spirit by empowering his followers to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. That's what the book of Acts is all about. Uh, Let me tell you, the, the landscape that I talked about earlier about our culture, that's the landscape in the book of Acts, by the way. That's the very same landscape. Nothing has changed. We're still living in the same type of culture that was present in the book of Acts. And yet the gospel message had the power to transform lives, to change people, to to bring the the dead communities back to life. My question is, do you believe that God can still do that today? (laughs) I got to tell you, I'm really convinced that that you believe that. Uh, Listen, I believe that God can do it again today in our day and time. And by the way, who doesn't want to see the power of God come in and transform lives? Do you want to see the power of God come in and free people from addiction? Do you want to see the power of God come in and restore homes and restore families? Do you want to see God free people from sin and from temptation? Do you want to see that? I believe that God can do it again today, and I believe that God wants to do it again today, and we have seen smatterings of it throughout our nation's history. Most recently, we're seeing revival break out on college campuses. We saw it in Asbury just a few years ago. We've seen mass baptisms taking place on college campuses. Listen, the God of the book of Acts is still alive and well. He is still at work today, and he wants to transform our community today, and he wants to use you to do it. I believe that firmly, and that's why I'm optimistic today. God still wants to bring revival to our country today. I believe that. I hope you believe it as well. But there's some things that happen that we need to learn about the way God works That's what we're going to be talking about for the next several uh, weeks, actually months, as we just work our way slowly through this book of Acts. So everybody's got your Bibles open to the book of Acts, right? (laughs) You guys are so convincing. I don't know why you guys are tired. Uh, Oh, well. Acts chapter 1. Some of us had kids go to prom last night, right? We're tired. You know, even though our kids are like eight, I don't know why they're going to prom, but whatever. (laughs) Anybody agree, by the way, parents, you you in agreement? Yes, yes. I don't know why they're going to, whatever. All right, here's what we read in Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them, and he gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Uh, He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, and he spoke about the kingdom of God, And on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. 
For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. They gathered around him and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Just stop right there with me. A couple of things we can learn about revival and the way transformation comes to a community. And the first thing I want you to notice is that revival is God's job. Transformation of people's hearts and lives is always God's job. Uh, look back there in verse 8, the disciples say, hey, are you going to restore the kingdom at this point, God? Is this what you're going to do? And Jesus responds by saying, none ya. It's none of your business what I'm going to do. I just want you to be my witnesses. In other words, Jesus says, you do your job, I'll do my job. We have a God who is very good at bringing transformation. We have a God who is very good at changing people's hearts and lives and restoring homes. Revival is always God's job. But I want you to notice in chapter 4 too, or in verse 4, uh, Jesus says, don't leave Jerusalem. Don't leave Jerusalem until you receive the gift that my Father promised you, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, why would they be tempted to leave Jerusalem? Well, they got work to do. Jesus told them in the Gospel of Luke there, before he ascended to heaven, he said, you're going to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. I need you to go and to teach everybody everything that I have taught you. I need you to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is what I need you to do. These guys are anxious to get started. Have you ever been there where you're just so anxious to get a task accomplished and you just want to jump in right now and somebody says to you, you need to just hold on a second and wait? Do you like that? You don't like that? You're eager to go, right? And you want to get this accomplished. And yet Jesus is saying, hey, I need you to wait until you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was so vital to the success of their mission that they could not start without, giving, without receiving the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the presence of Jesus in their lives who will continue to do the work that he has already started to do through them. There is no way that they could accomplish this mission on their own. They must be dependent on the Holy Spirit. If that was true then, it is much more true today. We must be dependent upon the Holy Spirit, not on the latest fads, not on the latest trends or anything like that. Instead, we must be dependent on the Holy Spirit if we want to see transformation and revival come to people's lives. We're told that verse 8, that the Holy Spirit will bring what? You'll receive what? power. The fuel source for the church is always the Holy Spirit, and we need the Holy Spirit to be able to accomplish what we want to do. But ultimately, the lesson we need to learn is that revival, transformation is always God's job. Who's ready for revival and transformation to come to our community today? I'm ready too. And sometimes, doesn't it feel like God is saying, just wait, just wait, <laughs> wait, and he's going to do his job. You know, any, anybody ever do any home remodeling or anything like that? I'm horrible at that. I'm going to admit it straight up. I am horrible at that. I did not go to college to learn that. I went to college to learn how to study the Word of God and teach it, not to remodel my house. My wife agrees with that assessment. Let me show you some lessons, though, that I've learned from it. Let me give you three in particular. One, it's always going to take longer than you think. If you think one week, you might as well plan for three months, <laughs> right? Here's the second lesson I've learned. It always costs more than you think as well because we don't factor in how many times we're gonna have to go to Lowe's or Home Depot to get more supplies that we forgot or think that we messed up. It always costs more than you think, doesn't it? And the last thing that I've learned, especially with me, <laughs> it's always messier than you think it's gonna be. It's always messier than you think it's gonna be. And I think those lessons are universal for all of us when it comes to anything we undertake like that. Now, if that's the case when it comes to home renovation and transformation, how much more so when it comes to community renovation and transformation? It's going to take longer than we think. It's going to cost us more than we realize, and it's probably going to be messier than we think. But the reality is God has promised that he will do the work. God has promised that he will do the work. He just asks us to trust him and to go along for the ride. Listen, God has always 
used the most unlikely people in the most unlikely of places in the most unlikely of circumstances to do his work. He took a shepherd boy to defeat Goliath. He took the youngest and the weakest in his family, Gideon, to free his people and to lead them. God has always used the marginalized. God has always used the, the outcast. God has always used those that society looks down upon to accomplish his work and in his mission. And that's what God wants to do today. And I know that we're ready for God to bring revival. I know we're ready for God to bring transformation. I know that. And I think that we're very sincere in that. And we've seen it several times in our nation's history. We've seen it uh, twice, especially in these great awakenings that we saw. Uh, we didn't see them. We weren't alive then. But in the 1700s, 1800s, these great awakenings that swept across our nation. And we want to see that again. And in the moment, it feels like God is saying, you need to wait. You need to wait until I am ready to move. Nobody likes to wait. I'm convinced that nobody likes to wait. Waiting is probably the most difficult thing that God asks us to do, is to wait. But there's one thing that you need to know about waiting, and that is the law of the harvest. Do you know when you must prepare to receive the harvest? It's before the harvest ever comes in. It's right after things have been sown. You know, when we moved into our house several years ago, we had to, to plant uh, grass seed to, to grow a lawn. And I still remember doing that, just looking at dirt and mud and everything. And finally, one day we got ready to where we could go out and plant the yard. And so I went out and I sowed all the grass seed, got everything covered. The next morning, had a cup of coffee and I rushed outside. And you know what I saw? Nothing. Mud and dirt. That's what I saw. But it wasn't too long that these little green specks began to pop up through the ground. And you know what hit me in that moment? I better get a lawnmower. <laughs> Why? Because I was going to have to mow grass soon, wasn't I? That's the law of the harvest. You've got to prepare for the harvest before it comes. Once the seed is sown, a harvest is going to come. And once the seed of God's word is sown in our community, we know that God will bring a harvest and that God will bring transformation. We need to get ready to receive that harvest before the harvest ever comes. And that's what we do while we are waiting on God to move into work is we get ready to receive the harvest. And so how does that look? What do we do to get ready to receive the harvest? I want to go right back into Acts chapter 1. Look at verses 3 and 4. In verses 3 and 4, here's what we read. After the resurrection of Jesus... He spent 40 days with his followers. And Luke there tells us that he gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. I don't know what those proofs were. You don't know what those proofs were. We can guess. We can guess at them. You know, there was probably meals shared together. He probably got tired of all them saying, hey, can I touch the hole in your, you know. He probably got tired of all that, but that was probably going on. I assume that there was probably a very tearful reunion with his mother. Can you imagine that scene? If that didn't take place, he got in trouble when she made it to heaven, I guarantee that. But all of these things were happening, and he was convincing them that the resurrection was real, and that he was alive. But let me show you one other thing that he did in verse 3. While he was with them, Luke says he taught them many things about the kingdom of God. Don't miss that. In other words, before he sent them out to work, he reminded them about the things of God. Now, he had spent three years with his followers, hadn't he? He taught them many things that we can read about in the Gospels. He taught them about the kingdom of God, and more importantly, he taught them what it looked like to live as a citizen of the king kingdom of God. You know, he taught them about faith. Faith as small as a mustard seed can move a mountain. He taught them about forgiveness of sins. He taught them about how to find freedom from worry and anxiety. He taught them how to live in community. He taught them how to forgive each other. These are things that he taught them while he was with them. And then for 40 days, he gives them a crash course about the things of God and about the kingdom of God and what it looks like to live as a citizen of the kingdom of God. In other words, he poured the word of God into his followers. 
And then revival took place. I find it so interesting that the movement of God that we read about in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 3 began after his followers were intensely taught about the things of God. A renewal for the word of God led to a renewal and revival in the community. Do we want to see God move today in our midst? Do we want to see revival come to our land? I believe we do. I also believe that we're very sincere in that. But are we sincere enough? Are we desperate enough to see God move that we are willing to rediscover our love for the word of God? Let me ask it again. Are we desperate enough to see God move that we're willing to rediscover our love for the word of God? Let me tell you, we don't need to wait to hear another word from God. We don't need to wait for a new revelation from God. We have everything we need from God here and now. The question is, are we willing to pour ourselves back into it and to find a renewal for his word? Uh, The American Bible Society recently released Uh, some statistics on the state of Bible reading in America today. Let me share those with you. By the way, Bible reading, daily Bible reading, reached its height in 2020. I wonder what was going on in 2020 that drove everybody to read their Bible. I I don't know, but everybody was reading their Bible daily in 2020. Since 2020, we have seen a steady decline in daily Bible reading to where the fact of today is that less than 10% of people are reading the word of God daily. Less than 10% of people, and these are professed Christians, followers of Jesus included in this, less than 10% of people are reading the word of God daily. And yet we wonder why we're not seeing revival and transformation sweeping across our communities. Every great movement of God has followed God's people having a renewed love for the word of God. We want to get to Acts chapter 2, I know. I want to get to Acts chapter 2 as well. But I'm telling you, we won't get to Acts chapter 2 until we do the work of Acts chapter 1. And that is rediscovering God's word. Not just to be read, but to be followed and to be lived out. Uh, The best example I can give you of how this works, by the way, is in the book of 2 Kings. Uh, There was a young king by the name of Josiah who ascended to the throne when he was only eight years old. Just think about that for a moment. He became king when he was eight years old. Talk about a McDonald's in every house. That was probably his campaign promise, right? Happy meals all around now. One thing he did after four years of being king was he was restoring the temple. And you know what they found in the temple? They found the word of God. And this king, at just 11 or 12 years old, had the courage to have the word of God read aloud for all people to hear. When the people heard the word of God being proclaimed, they were cut to the heart. They were heartbroken at the way that they were living their lives. They were involved in worship of many different gods. And yet when they heard the word of God proclaimed, they they repented. And they turned back to God. And revival broke out in the land. Why? Because the word of God was rediscovered. And the people were cut to the heart. And they repented. Revival broke out. Revival is always marked, by the way, by repentance. It's always marked with an obedience to the word of God. It's always marked by being willing to be God's faithful witness to the world around. That's the way revival happens. Those things will not happen, though, until... Until we rediscover the word of God, not just to be read, but actually to be our guide. Let me share with you some things about the word of God that we read in God's word. In Hebrews, we're reminded the word of God is alive and active. The word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Do you believe that the word of God is alive and active? I hope you do. 
because the Word of God is alive and active. There is power in the Word of God. Let me share with you out of the book of Psalms, two places in Psalms. Your Word is a lamp for my feet and a light to my path. By the way, I'm just curious. Anybody here afraid of the dark? Be honest. Thank you. I, I'm afraid of the dark sometimes too, right? And, and we got to walk around in the dark, and the only thing you're wanting when you're in the dark is what? You want a flashlight, don't you? Uh, yeah, exactly. I want a flashlight. I want something to guide me. Now, we're living in dark times. We're seeing darkness all around us. And we're promised here that the word of God is our, is our lamp. It is our light. It is our guide. And so as a result of that, what we need to do is we need to hide the word in our heart that we might not sin against God. You want to know how to navigate the darkness of the world? It's right here. It's the word of God. It's the word of God. Listen, until we rediscover God's word for our hearts and for our lives, we will never see revival break out. Let me share with you some of the things that we learn in the word of God. Here's some things that we learn in the word of God. We learn about how to deal with worry and anxiety. You realize that, right? Anybody struggle with one of those two, worry or anxiety? Nobody? Exactly. I, I know. I'm the only one, right? No. You want to know how to deal with worry and anxiety? Go to the Word of God, and you'll find the guide. You'll find the answer. We also learn about hope. We're a people that need hope, don't we? You find hope in the Word of God. We learn about freedom from sin. We learn about how to love people. Not just people that we agree with, by the way, but people that we don't agree with, people that don't live like us. We learn how to be joyful in spite of difficult and trying circumstances. We also learn about the promises of God and the reality that no matter what happens, we're children of God and God is our father and heaven is our ultimate home. This is what we learn from the word of God. When we learn these things and we begin to enact them in our lives, our lives look different from everyone around us. And it becomes very attractive to a world that is searching for these very things. The very things the world is searching for are found in the word of God. Let me ask you again, do you want to see God do amazing things in our midst today? Then we've got to rediscover our love for the word of God. Are you willing to allow the word of God to be hidden in your heart? Are you willing to allow the word of God to be your guide? Are you willing to rediscover God's word? Because until we do that, we're not going to see the revival of Acts chapter 2. Until we do that. I've got a challenge for you. You ready for it? Anybody want rescue like we were singing about earlier? Come and rescue me from this. Here's my challenge for you. If it is true that only 10% of people, and I believe that, are finding themselves in the Word of God daily, I want to challenge you to read the Word of God daily. And here's two ways I want you to do that. Now, I, I practice reading through the Word of God from beginning to end every year, and I am starting to morph that into something different. One thing I would encourage you to do, here's one challenge if you're willing to take this, is I want you to read a different psalm every day. Read a different psalm every day. Work your way right through the, there's 150 of them. Work your way right through it. You can go through the book of Psalms twice in one year. And the reason I want you to go to the book of Psalms, Tim said this last week, is we learn so much about how to cry out to God in times of hardship and difficulty, but also in times of goodness and, and blessing. We learn how to cry out to God by reading through the book of Psalms. And most of those Psalms are pretty short. We're talking like five, six verses, most of them, until you get to 119, then it's 142 verses. But you can get through that, trust me. So read a psalm every day. Here's the second challenge I have for you. If you're willing to undertake this, this is a little bit different. I'm going to ask you to read the book of James with me. Now, hold on, and let me tell you how we're going to read this. The book of James is five chapters. It's among the most practical book in the New Testament, showing us how to live as followers of Jesus and how to live in the kingdom of God. But here's what I want to ask you to do. For one month, I want to ask you to read all five chapters every day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Here's why I want you to do that. 
It is so easy for us just to get lost in the words, isn't it, and not really realize what we're reading. But repetition of reading it daily helps it to stick, and we will learn more and more about what God desires for us if we will do that. At the end of 30 days, do you think you'll have a good grasp of what James is asking us to do? More than that, you're going to have a good pattern and a good habit established already in your mind in 30 days of reading the Word of God and pouring into it. So I'm asking you to do those two things. Read a psalm every day, and if you can, read the book of James every day for a month. And some of you are like, I'll take the psalm. That's fine. We've got to start somewhere, right? We're going to start somewhere with this. But we are going to rediscover our love for the Word of God because we want God to do amazing things in our midst. Next week, we'll talk about the second key that we see in Acts chapter 1 that leads to revival breaking out. So I hope you come back and join us uh, for that. I'm going to say a word of prayer for us. Uh, we're going to be dismissed. As always, if you're here this morning, you want someone to pray with you, uh, someone to talk with you about whatever is going on, if you want to learn more about making Jesus uh, the Lord of your life and, ex and it, uh, being able to experience that power and that freedom and that joy that only he can give, I'd love to talk to you about that as well today. Now let's stand together, and I'll say a prayer for us, and we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you. We thank you for our time together today. Lord, I thank you for the promises that we read in your word and for the way that you work, Lord, and just for the realization that you're the same today as you were yesterday. You never change, Lord. That means that your goal hasn't changed yet. You want to see people come to you, and you want to use us in that process. And so here we are, Lord, and we're asking you to simply do it again in our midst. Do again what you did in the book of Acts today in our community, in our homes. Lord, I pray that you will bring transformation to lives, freedom from sin, and that you'll restore what the enemy has broken. Lord, will you watch over us as we go from this place, and it's in the name of Jesus we pray, and amen. Hey, you're dismissed. Before you go, say hi to somebody.